All right, everybody, good morning. My name is Nick Fish. I'm the development director for American Atheists, and welcome to the first session on the final day of our 2014 National Convention. This is a panel discussion about the intersection of LGBT activism and atheist activism. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our fantastic panel, starting at my right, or left, Marsha Botzer. Uh, is a fantastic activist who has served the LGBT community, the atheist community, and the progressive community for more than 35 years. She's a founding member of Equality Washington and a founding board member of Equal Rights Washington. She also founded Seattle's Ingersoll Gender Center. Marsha is the co-chair, or has served as the co-chair of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and as national co-chair of the Obama Pride Campaign in 2008, and is currently on the board of directors for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Welcome, Marsha. Our next panelist is Greta Christina. Greta needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Greta is a blogger at Freethought Blogs on Greta's blog, uh, on topics of atheism, sexuality, LGBT issues, politics, and culture. She's the author of Why Are You Atheists So Angry? Fantastic book if you haven't already read it. And her new book, which you can get right now in our bookstore, Coming Out Atheist, which recently hit number one on the Kindle portion of Amazon under the atheism section. Uh, she, Greta, Greta has published in countless magazines and other publications, and has also written a book of dirty erotic fiction. Erotic fiction, sorry, I wanted to make sure I got the words right. Uh, and uh, lives in San Francisco with her wife, Ingrid. So give, every, give everyone, give Greta a hand. And the final panelist here is Zach Ford. Zach is the editor of Think Progress's LGBT blog. Uh, he works on social justice issues, atheism, and LGBT activism, and the intersection of all of that stuff. So his current job is pretty fantastic, I would say. Um, <laughs> Zach hosts a podcast, Queer and Queerer, is a frequent guest on religious conservative talk radio, as we all should be, and uh, is a pretty fantastic guy. So everyone give Zach a hand. So the way we're gonna start things here is I'm gonna have a few prompts and we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion here. Um, and then once I, we've gotten through that, uh, we would like to take questions from the audience. Uh, there should be uh, note cards or there should be volunteers available with note cards. Uh, if there are not, uh, we'll see if we can have someone go track them down um, so that you guys can ask some questions because we want this to be a good conversation. Um, so I'd like to start and we'd like to start uh, talking about the coming out experience and the differences between the LGBT coming out process versus the atheist coming out process. Talk about some similarities, some differences. Uh, let's just start from there. Do you wanna, do you wanna go ahead first, Marsha? All right then, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Nick. And thank you to the folks signing for us, and, and especially to you, friends. Yeah, um, coming out, goodness sakes, it, for me it was uh, a long process, yes. Starting with all that, it, it, you heard me do my thing yesterday. It, it did start with all that labor work and discovering that uh, there were possibilities beyond what I uh, expected in the 60s. Uh, then there was the whole hippie movement, I didn't mention that, which showed me there was not only a, a, a way to work together, but ways to come out in, in all kinds of uh, uh, forms and, and methods. But it wasn't until a, a bit of a crisis around my identity later on in, in the 20s that, uh, like so many of us, you know, you just sit at three o'clock in the morning and say, I cannot go on unless I do something to recognize who I am. That kind of thing that led to a coming out around gender that it took longer. Now the atheism, goodness sakes, that little story about finding the American Atheist magazine, um, that was a very important point because certainly by then I'd been through, as again, so many of us, a, 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 a religious period that didn't make any sense. And yet, there was, at least for me, very little outlet to deal with it. So finally, uh, when materials appeared and a confirmation of not being alone in that kind of thinking, uh, the process was set. So that was early, early on um, in the teens uh, that that began. And then finally, the magazine in the 70s, a long time. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going on. 
Uh, so, and certainly my own experience was, you know, I came out as bisexual 800,000 million billion years ago. Um, and, um, and, and basically came out as an atheist almost as soon as I realized I was an atheist because I was already blogging and I was already spewing about everything in my personal life, so why not this? Um, uh, what I found when I was researching the book, the Coming Out Atheist book, uh, you know, certainly I've read a lot of stories from LGBT atheists, and also I've just talked with at conferences and talks and so on. And obviously coming out is really different for every atheist, it's really different for every LGBTQ person, and it's really different for every LGBTQ atheist. Um, what I found though is that it's really common for it, for LGBTQ atheists to say that it's harder to come out as atheist than it is to come out as queer. Um, and I think a lot of that is just that the queer movement has, you know, 35, 40 years on us. You know, they've been a very, they, we, you know, it, it's hard to say we because I'm in both, but um, LGBT people, you know, the move, that movement has been very visible, vocal, active, mobilized for so many decades. And we're only kind of maybe, I would say, 10 years into that or so. Um, and, you know, since, you know, the publication of God Delusion and, you know, Sam Harris's book and, and you know, other things that really got the ball rolling in this movement. Um, so, so I think that we're, we're and, and a lot of LGBT people say that. They say, you know, I came out as gay and it was really easy, and so I thought coming out as atheist would be super easy too, and, and it wasn't. Um, so, you know, we can maybe talk about that more, but, um, yeah. You know, I thought coming out as gay was easy, and that coming out as atheist would be just as easy, but it wasn't. Um, my coming out as gay story was pretty straightforward. I didn't know any gay people in my small Pennsylvania town. I went to Ithaca College, one of the top 20 LGBT-friendly campuses in the country, met gay people for the first time, and was like, oh, hey, that's me too. <laughs> Easy breezy, <laughs> no problem. Um, but my, my decline, if you will, into atheism was much more gradual from uh, lapsed Catholic to going to evangelical youth groups, to despising organized religion, to uh, having my own relationship with Jesus, to pastafarianism, <laughs> then asking, this is the best part, asking for the God delusion for Christmas, and then reading it. Um, and when I first came out as atheist, it was actually kind of a non-event. Uh, I was in grad school in Iowa, which was a sort of interesting place to be um, reconciling with your religion. And it wasn't actually until later that year when Prop 8 passed. And um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit later is that there's a lot of research in the academic world, in the psychological, sociological, academic world about the coming out process in, in the LGBT model. And there's all these different models and understandings we have about how people go through that process, how they come to terms with it. And we don't have any of that for atheism. There's not any, I mean, we have wonderful resources like Greta's book, but there's not like this academic research about it. But I knew enough from my models of LGBT coming out that when Prop 8 passed, it launched my atheism coming out into what, um, the original model, the caste model, called the pride phase, which is where you over-identify in, in such a way with your identity. And so I was posting angry things on Facebook, I was blaming religion for all LGBT oppression, which arguably is still true, but I was doing it, I was doing it in a way that was not particularly tactful, and particularly for my cohort in grad school who were mostly from the Midwest and mostly uh, identified with religion. Uh, we, we bashed heads a lot, and it was very complicated. And it actually, as a result, I started blogging. I actually started blogging to write about atheism, because what I found was I needed a place where I could process in sort of a longer form what that identity meant, and how I was seeing the world, and how I was relating to these different issues in a way that other people could, could appreciate, as opposed to just like angry little jabs on Facebook and whatnot. Um, and so I, I sort of owe a lot of credit to that process because now I get to write about social justice issues and critiquing religion on an almost daily basis. So, um, as Greta says, no one really regrets the coming out atheist experience. And even though mine was a bit more challenging, it, it turned out in a really good way. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Um, sort of dovetailing into that, um, I want to talk a little bit about the the language that we use, the, the coming out language. Um, we, we, we borrow a lot of the language from the LGBT movement uh, to describe what goes on uh, in the atheist movement. 
Um, we've gotten, we get critiques from LGBT activists who say, you know, you're, you're misappropriating uh, coming out um, on even the most basic level, or you're, you're misappropriating, this is not a civil rights issue, or so on. Uh, the, it goes on and on. Uh, what do you think about that? Are, are, does the atheist movement, does the atheist community, is, is it just convenient shorthand? What, what, what do you think? And you just, whoever wants to jump in. Actually, I want to jump in on that because, hey, I just wrote the book Coming Out Atheist. And, you know, <laughs> um, um, and the thing is, I mean, I get the critique about appropriating the language, but you know what? The phrase coming out, that cat is out of the bag. The phrase coming out has been used to mean disclosing something about yourself that people probably don't know and might have a problem with. That's been used for decades now by lots of communities. You know, people talk about coming out as polyamorous, talk about coming out kinky. People talk about coming out with unpopular political positions, you know, Red Sox fans, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's, you know, that, you know, we don't own that anymore. And, and there's this sort of, I think the whole thing about appropriating language is complicated because language is organic. And the reality is that, you know, if there's language that the community uses to describe itself, and then that community does start to participate in the larger community and not be insular, uh, that language is going to spread. And it's, you know, it's, it, to some extent, I think it's part of our success, you know, that we are, you know, very much participants in the larger public sphere. And there is something that's lost when that happens. You know, there is a sort of, a, there is something special when a community is, um, you know, tight, you know, tightly, you know, it's nine o'clock in the morning, I can't think of my language words here. You know, you know, is very uh, interwoven and, you know, like a family. You know, there is something special that's lost when we're just sort of part of the larger world. But I, I personally think that there's a, a lot more that's gained. I'll jump in here. I think one of the big problems we face across all different communities and movements is that it's very easy to want to compare an experience, uh, say, you know, People were denied service at lunch counters because they were black, and people are denied cakes and photographers because they're same-sex couples. At a basic level, that discrimination is the same. But when we start to compare what it, those lived experiences are and what the cultural and historical contexts are, they're obviously very different. And so we need to sort of parse these words a little bit. And I think what ends up happening is we're all very sort of proud of the identities that we have, and it kind of becomes a little bit of oppression Olympics. Well, your experience isn't like mine, so don't try to say that it's the same, because it's not. Well, parts of it are, <laughs> and conceptually at a base level, it is. Um, and I, you know, I think just to kind of put some models in your head, there's two kind of general models that I help people understand when I do lectures on LGBT issues of coming out. Generally, if you're gay, coming out is a gradual process that increases over the scope of your life. Because not only do you start telling people that you're gay, but eventually you start dating people of the same sex, you find a committed partner of the same sex, you settle down with the person of the same sex, you have a child, you join a community, you're participating in a school. The visibility of your gayness increases. And so the amount of coming out that you have to do increases. Likewise, or uh, contrastingly, in the trans community, you, your experience might be the exact opposite, where you come to terms with your gender identity and go through a transition, which is a burst of like, hey, everyone, here's my identity. But then once you've you know, achieved a place where you feel that your gender identity has been realized, you might not identify openly that much. You might choose to pass, you might choose to blend in. You know, if trans activism is not part of your life, you might just go through your life living as a trans man or trans woman, as if you're just a man or a woman and, and there's nothing different and you don't come out as much. And those are two very different models and I feel like coming out atheist is somewhere in between uh, because there is an extent to which we're always coming out and always sort of identifying, but I think, and here's a, an important distinction, there's not the same kind of legal discrimination against the atheist community that there is against the LGBT community still. There's certainly discrimination, there's certainly bigotry, there's certainly biases, um, and it's still a social justice issue. But I think where people are saying that it's not a civil rights issue is the fact that there are 29 states where you can still be fired for being gay. There are 32 states where you can still be fired for being trans. There are 27 states that don't have a single law in the book protecting students from being bullied for their sexual orientation or gender identity. 43% of trans people have experienced such discrimination and poverty in their life that they've in, turned to sex work at some point to support themselves. Like, the amount of 
discrimination that LGBT people experience in a very literal, legal way doesn't compare to how we experience discrimination in the atheist community. And if we try to assert that those experiences are the same, then yeah, people are going to kind of go on the defensive. But if we recognize that in a general sense, disclosing our identities um, is a problem, we could start finding the comparisons there um, and, and learn how to support each other. I am so proud to be on this panel with my colleagues. Oh my goodness, brilliant thinkers. A um, couple, of, couple of thoughts here. Uh, I know that uh, in, in our world of LGBT, there are so many people writing and thinking in the trans world. We are in the process of a flood of PhDs and MAs and all this, you know, thinking about every aspect of gender and gender identity. That's a process for the atheist movement as well, I think, especially uh, individuals who are in school now or thinking about that or, or starting their blogs or getting going, because it, it, it leads to a conversation, a powerful bubbling stew of conversation. I tell you this, the trans community probably is the word of the week club, as far as naming and finding a new term, that sort of thing, but it is brilliant in the sense that what a conversation it's been to help us all make sense, not only of our own identities and our processes, but how we make a movement in the world. So there's all of that, I'll tell you this. Many years ago, uh, I sat with some folks in a basement in Denver. We were trans, actually we didn't have the word transgender at the time. And our question was, are we gonna go on a, what we used to call an underground radio show and talk about ourselves? And we talked, and we talked, we, we finally voted at about 11 o'clock at night and the, the vote was no. We're not going to go on the show because in those days the thought was if they out there know about us in here, they'll kill us. It's a long way from there to the incredibly vocal and active world. I think it's the same thing. Okay. Great. I just want to jump in on the civil yeah. rights question really, really quickly, which is that I think that when we talk about the question of, you know, is atheism a civil rights issue, I think it tends to be a certain amount of either or thinking. You know, that either it's a civil rights issue that is therefore on the same scale as, you know, civil rights for African Americans, civil rights for LGBTQ people, um, or it's not at all. And, and I see that both from people who are in these other communities and who are in the atheist community. It's like people in the atheist community have heard say, it's like, you know, the fact that we're at the, you know, we tend to be at the bottom of those lists, you know, that's like the least trusted people who are least likely to be voted for and so on. And that's true, and that's important. You know, at the same time, you know, we're not experiencing the same level of violence against us, at least not in this country, at least not in the United States. Uh, we're not experiencing the just, you know, entrenched and systemic economic uh, blight that's, you know, happening in the African American community and the, you know, the Jim Crow, you know, the whole new Jim Crow thing with drug laws and imprisonment, and prison policies. You know, we're just not experiencing that. And I think that sort of both sides need to acknowledge that, like, yes, this is a civil rights issue. There's real discrimination. There's real bigotry. Um, you, know, you look what happens in atheists in the military. I think that's a perfect example. You know, it's, it's, there's a degree to, you know, it's like that's theocracy in action in this country. Um, at the same time, when we try to do the Oppression Olympics and say, therefore, I understand what your experience is like as an African American or you know, what your experience right. is like as, you know, a queer kid who got beaten up in high school, you know, it's not the same. And I think that we need to acknowledge that. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much for that. Um, going, shifting gears a little bit into working within the movements, um, if you want to call them that, working within the LGBT community, the, the, the set of organizations that exist, the, the great conferences, the great support networks that exist, also the atheist movement and community, the, the organizations that exist, the conferences like this, the secular student groups, and so on and so forth. What need, there, there needs to, I, I think, there needs to be more of a um, visibility for atheists within the LGBT community. We know, for example, that the group uh, that has the most atheists in it, unless you count Jews, is LGBT people. Um, so we know that there are tons. I, I mean, it's, it's two or three times as many atheists in the LGBT community as there are in the general public. It may even be higher than that. But you don't see as much visibility. Um, why do you think that is? Can I jump in on this one? Great. I have a rant here, um, <laughs> which is that a lot of individuals and also organizations in the LGBT movement 
uh, have been deliberately trying to position LGBT people as ju we're just like you. We're mainstream. We're just like you. We have the dogs and the house and the mortgage and you know the, the kids and so on. The marriage. Yeah. Um, and part of that, at least in the United States, has been positioning us as religious. Yeah. You know, because that's there is sort of this equation of you know being American means being religious. And so as a result, there's been this deliberate attempt to highlight religiosity in, you know, obviously more progressive, fuzzy form of it, but there's been this attempt, very conscious attempt, at <laughs> HRC, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> to, um, to, you know, present us as just like you by presenting us as religious, and so the atheists in the LGBT movement have been kind of deliberately thrown under the bus. And, you know, and the degree to which, uh, we were just at the Creating Change conference, and this is my first time being at Creating Change. It's a big LGBT conference that happens every year. And I'd never been before. The degree to which religion was fucking everywhere. And like, and some like really with some creepy anti-atheist stuff. It's like there was this atheist panel that was supposedly on atheist spirituality. And it was horrible. Exactly. It was like this guy was like going I walked on. out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Dad walked out of it. I stuck with it so I could argue with the guy, <laughs> but it was all this stuff about how, well, it's okay if you're an atheist, but you still have to believe in the supernatural because if you don't, you know, you you're don't have meaning and joy. And you're a corpse hope. is what he said. You what? He said you're a corpse you're if a you don't corpse. have a soul. He said it's like you have no, <laughs> no, no. You're on. Oh, th there we go. You have no real life. Um, and the degree to which, you know, and it, and it, it so that was just really upsetting to me. Um, and I think that atheists are nervous about coming out in the LGBT community uh, because, because of that, because you know, we have been kind of deliberately pushed aside. So I'll jump in. Am I on now? Hello? Oh, okay. Hold on. Hold on just one second. Hello? There we go. <laughs> so this is my fifth Creating Change conference this year. <laughs> and you know, I, I work specifically in the LGBT movement. I identify as an atheist, and I have a lot of writing experience in that world, but I've sort of had to put that in the back seat a little bit. Um, and part of that is because the identity is not as salient to me, um, because on a daily basis, um, I feel it's a lot more important that I advocate for my ability to not be fired in certain states, or for my ability to have my marriage recognized in certain states, although I'm totally single, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> more than it is whether or not you know, people are praying at a meeting. I don't like that people are praying at you know, a city council meeting, but it's not an issue that like has the same sort of impetus in my life, and so I, I sort of don't necessarily feel um, that I have to prioritize it as much. But when I went to Creating Change um, over the past couple of years, I had the same experience, such that um, the task force, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, which organizes the conference, actually has a whole big sub-faith conference at Creating Change where people from all kinds of different denominations come in, and there are millions of different workshops about working within particular faith traditions and recruiting allies who are people of faith and all of this great stuff. And I think that's good, because what I care about is LGBT equality. And to get LGBT equality, I'm going to have better luck if I have people of faith working on my side than working on Tony Perkins' side. So there's something good there. But there was also no space for me. And so I actually created that space um, and started the Atheist Caucus. And for a couple of years, for a couple of years, it was the only atheist visibility at the conference. And every year, uh, there's a lot of young people that go to Creating Change. And, and these young 20-somethings uh, or even late teens, um, but some other folks would all come into this room and they'd all be like, this is the first time I've ever been in a room with this many other non-believers. And it was just amazing, because here they are. They're in the LGBT community. They know that religion is out to get them for the, to the larger extent. And they've had to kind of like you know, live in this bubble. So that's why we, I think that coming out atheist experience is much harder. But at the same time, this is my first atheist conference. And I kind of feel like there's not a lot of room for me to identify as LGBT. I kind of feel like LGBT people are underrepresented here. Like not even like the normal percentage of LGBT people you'd expect in a random sample. And I think you, we have to think about, are we atheists? And that means we only care about the sort of atheist specific get religion out of the public space issues. Or are we atheists, and that means we're allies to everybody else who has an experience that's infringed upon by religion. And I know that there are a lot of people here at this conference and then throughout the atheist community that land somewhere differently on that. They don't want to work with people of faith because that feels like reinforcing 
you know, their, those people's beliefs or the, the merit of what they believe. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think we have to be able to think about the idea that what we want is to not have religion affect our lives. And that doesn't necessarily equate eliminating religion or making everybody else atheist. And, and that's a tough thing to wrestle with. But if we want to be allies to other communities, if we want to create spaces that are more inclusive, um, that aren't male-dominated, white-dominated, heterosexual-dominated, cisgender-dominated, we have to recognize how to be allies to others and not just live in our sort of echo chamber around atheist issues. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly move to the next thing because it... We, we, it moves beautifully into that, and then I'll go to Marsha because I know that you would have a lot to say about this. Um, so Zach touched on what I think is a really important part uh, point about this, that achieving sort of, sort of policy goals uh, around issues of LGBT equality or even around secular equality uh, or secular government, that sometimes we do have to work with, or you know, you're forced to work with people of faith. The, you know, the, 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 the reality is that there are somewhere between five and 10% of Americans, depending on how you define atheist, that are atheists, even if they don't use the word, five and 10%. So it's hard to win, to create a winning voting coalition with, 10, with just 10%. Um, so are we selling out when we work with religious communities? Or when we say, it's great that Jesus told you that everybody should be equal, fantastic. Is that, is that selling out, Marsha? Do you, do you want to happen on that? I want to win. I want to win. And um, so this is a difficult question. Um, we are working together. That's the way it is. So I think a more subtle response will be how we improve that relationship. This is Creating Change Conference. I've been with the task force. I've chaired it twice uh, for many years. And one of the glories of that organization is that things bubble up through it. Like the reason there's any faith is we have this thing called the welcoming and, uh, project, and it's all this faith, everything that Zach was talking about. Um, but it bubbled up because people wanted it. That's how the task force responds. Um, at the board level, I've been working on changing um, things like strategic plans and policy to include everything, including atheism. But what we need is more folks, more folks to come forward and do workshops there and join the board, yes, if you're interested, um, and enter into it because that will change the, the movement. That will change the movement in a powerful way. I think that's going to be the strength because when the discussions that we've been having here all weekend, I mean all, all during the conference, permeate creating change, 25% of the folks were under uh, 20, 25, I think that's what it was, out of about 35, 3,800 folks who come to it, 300 workshops, that sort of thing. So that's my immediate take, that it's there. We need more of our voices there, and that's what will change and improve. I just want to jump in and say, though, that one of the great things that's happened is that uh, last year, American atheists came to creating change for the first time. and. Suddenly, I was not the only one carrying the torch for atheism because now there was someone, you know, tabling there, creating visibility, distributing pins. Um, and then this year, American Atheist was back, and we had SSA there as well, which was fantastic. And we had numerous workshops beyond my caucus that had atheism in the title. So we're creating that space there. Um, and I, I want to likewise give American Atheist credit for doing the, the opposite here. Gender-neutral bathrooms. Um, I, I hope it's fair to assume is a trick you guys learned at creating change, because I, no, yes, no, okay, yeah, I mean, absolutely. maybe, maybe <laughs> I mean, we yeah. unabashedly stole that. Yes, yeah, absolutely, sure. <laughs> and and it's has everyone had a wonderful learning experience going to bathroom with people of the opposite sex? <laughs> Amazing how something so simple can kind of open our mind to you know, creating safer spaces, um, as well as a lot of the rhetoric in your program. I don't know if you read the Code of Conduct or the little explanation of gender-neutral bathrooms. Like, American Atheist is doing the right thing and creating that space here, but it's, it requires that effort on, on both sides to, to, to bubble up through and say, we, we need to be doing this to fully achieve our goals with the maximum potential. And uh, I'm sorry, just real quick, I want to tease something very quickly and then I'll let you go, Gre Greta. Um, when, we, when, we're, when we're working towards some policy goal, um, it's okay for us, I think, to prioritize something where at American Atheists, we can, we can still say, 
listen, we do not really want to be involved in the, uh, for example, the um, uh, faith-based initiatives. American Atheist is probably not going to open a soup kitchen and get federal money under the faith-based initiatives because we would like to see the whole program gone. Um, but at the same time, we have to be, do, do, you, do you all think we have to be part of that conversation because unfortunately, or like it or not, or however you want to phrase that, that's the space that there is for us uh, as atheists to get at the government. So I, I actually want to have a possibly dissenting position on this, or subtle, you know, subtly dissenting position. Um, I, do I think it's worthwhile for atheists as individuals or organizations to do coalition work with, you know, progressive religious groups that we have issues in common with? Well, yes, of course, you know, that's what coalition work means. You know, it's like you work together on things that you have in common, you temporarily set aside issues that you disagree about. So I don't have an issue with that. But I think there's a couple things we need to remember. One, that should never happen at the cost of atheists having to shut up about our atheism. Um, and, and, and that too often is the cost. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there is this expectation that, that if, you're gonna, if we're gonna be at the table, we have to have tape over our mouths um, about the thing, that, about the whole freaking reason we're at the table. Um, and, you know, and I get there's, you know, we, if you're actually working on a particular issue, on that particular project, you can temporarily set aside the arguments about whether God exists, but we shouldn't have to set aside those arguments forever. We shouldn't be expected that if you want to work in this coalition, you never, ever get to try to persuade people out of religion because that's intolerant. Um, and the other, and I think that that's true on an individual level, on an institutional level. The other thing is I think that it's important to remember both for individuals and institutions, there are gonna be some people who don't want to do it. And there's gonna be some institutions that don't wanna do it. There's some individuals who, who have been really deeply damaged by religion and they do not want a damn thing to do with it. They don't wanna work in coalition, they want nothing to do with it. And I think that we need to respect that and, and not try to pressure them into it. And I think that that's valid for organizations. To, I think it's valid for American atheists, for instance, to say, no, we're the badasses, we're the hardliners. You know, it's like, sure, we can work in, some, in coalition on some issues we have in common, you know, same-sex marriage or reproductive rights or whatever. Um, but we send the secular coalition. I'm sorry? We send the secular coalition to do that for us, so we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like you know, but you know, but you know, our job is to be the hardline, absolute church-state separationists, and absolute uh, people who are saying you know it's a myth, you know. And I think that it's legitimate both for individuals and organizations to opt out. Yeah. I, I, let me interject one thing. I'm just going to uh, housekeeping thing. If you have questions, um, go ahead and uh, raise your hand and give them to Carla um, so that she can bring them up and that I can start arranging them while Zach is doing his thought, and then we'll start doing questions. So I think Greta is absolutely right, but I reject the notion that you have to compromise on your own identities in order to be part of that coalition. If anything, I think the atheist community needs to make it a burden on the LGBT community to be more inclusive of having atheists at the table. We need to step up and say, we support LGBT equality. We recognize that this bogus notion of religious liberty is at the forefront of all of these efforts to, uh, to not only impact women's health through Hobby Lobby, but like the Arizona bill, the Mississippi bill, and all these other efforts across numerous states to try to enforce discrimination against LGBT people. We need to say, we oppose that. We are partners for LGBT equality. And I know that you have these other partners of faith, and we don't agree on that at all, and we're not going to shut up about it either, but we're coming to the table. We are helping you win this to make the country a better place to push back on this religious privilege that's being imposed on LGBT people. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that it requires the, the kind of compromise um, that you refer to. I think we need to be brash and own our atheism and be visible about that because it actually helps us. It's sort of the same thing that you talk about in your book, Greta, about how coming out helps other people come out. Being allies helps people be allies to us. This is something the LGBT community has learned a lot, particularly around the issue of immigration. 
Um, the idea of coming out is something we also share with undocumented immigrants. And the, the fear that they have, the legal ramifications if you know, they are outed as undocumented, is, has built this wonderful foundation to be allies in each other's spaces. And there's a number of amazingly outspoken queer dreamers who are you know, bridging that gap in, in ways that I, I don't think a lot of us could have fathomed 10 years ago. Um, and so we have to learn from that model and be the allies we want others to be to us uh, by supporting other communities. I, I absolutely agree. And I'll speak for myself, but I would I think it is absolutely my duty and my responsibility to participate here, not just simply to ask you to come and change everything. No, not at all, not at all. I, I'm thinking of this one thing, that at, at Creating Change there's often this thing called the sh shower of stoles. You know, the thing that, the, the, the religious often wear. It's an art piece. I want to see a shower of atheists, and I want to do everything I can to, to make sure that that happens. Because when that happens, there will be discussions, like we're having here. There will be discussions, and there will be changes. I actually just want to clarify really quick. I'm definitely not saying we shouldn't be brash. Def you know, anybody who knows me knows I'm not saying we should be brash. I absolutely think we should be brash. We should be visible. My only point was that, you know, if you're doing, let's say you're doing with a religious group, you're going down to New Orleans to rebuild Katrina. You know, you've got this pro service project that you're doing together. I think it's valid to say, okay, for the purpose of this project, while we're on the bus together, let's suspend the arguments about whether God exists. I think that it's worth, and if people want to get those arguments, that's fine, but if people want to say, look, for the purpose of this argument, let's set that aside for now. You know, but, my, but I definitely think that we should be visible as atheists, and that we shouldn't be asked to, to keep our atheism secret, and we shouldn't be asked to suspend those arguments arguments when we're not on that project, when we're not on that, that, that bus together. So I think um, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm going I'm to try to get through as many of these questions as I can. Uh, but uh, the first one I thought was, uh, it sort of touched on some stuff we've talked about. Um, going back to the more affirming, accepting congregations that say, you know, all are welcome. Uh, does it, do we, should we go after them? And, you know, does, uh, we want people to be included, and we want people to be able to feel safe and have a community. Do, do we need to be doing more community building and do we still need, I mean, I think that probably is an obvious answer, that we need to be doing more community building. But can we, do we give them a pass on some things? Or do we say, yeah, it still matters whether or not some guy was nailed to a cross and then put in a cave and then rose from the dead. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, <laughs> does that matter? Do we need to just say, listen, or like American Atheist, or do we need to segregate that out, separate out who is doing what? Uh, we've done, we've talked that about coalition. I, I absolutely think we should be pushing back on moderate and progressive and mushy religion. I mean, I don't think it does as much harm as, as the hardline version, but I think it still does harm. Um, you know, and you know, people still make really bad, horrible de decisions for no good reason because they think their friend in the sky is going to help them. Um, and that's true for mushy religion as well. Um, you know, does it do as much harm? No, of course not. But I think that we that it's legitimate to push back on it. It, it gives cover. You think it gives cover to the if, well, it, and, it, and it gives cover to the to the more to the more hardline versions. It gives sure. cover to the idea that it is reasonable to make decisions yes. about your life based on what your invisible friend thinks. Right. You know, I, I sometimes think that like the atheist community has the exact opposite approach that the LGBT community has been trying for a long time. The LGBT community has said, we're going to be this, do this very piecemeal. We're going to go state by state, issue by issue, and do each little thing until we get everything. And in a, it's been slow, but it's kind of worked, right? We now have lots of visibility. We have lots of acceptance. We're, you know, we're going to have marriage equality for the whole country within two years. Like, these things have all worked out, but it's been really frustrating for those of us in the movement who don't feel like that pace was good enough. I sometimes get the sense that the atheist community wants it like all and wants it right now, like get rid of religion, <laughs> just forget it. And, and I share that outcome, but I sometimes wonder if, again, you know, LGBT community sped up and that worked. And sometimes I wonder if the atheist community slowed down just a little, it would work too. Uh, and I, I, I said this brilliant thing yesterday and I luckily remembered it so that I can say it again to a full audience. You know, if you let people cherry pick enough, there won't be any cherries left, and it won't have mattered if you chopped down the tree. Mm. So think about it that way. I mean, what do we really want is the, 
the freedom from religion imposing on our lives. And the more progressive and mushier I think we get those churches, the, the less they're really infringing on what we're trying to achieve. And so I think we just have to choose our enemies wisely. I think we have to think about our goals. What do we actually want to accomplish? And, and make sure that all of those are sort of in a balance so that we're not, you know, busting people who aren't really the problem um, to the detriment of working against people who really are hurting different populations in different ways. I actually just want to jump in very quickly Thank then. You. But because you said something that I think is key about our goals. I don't think we have the same goals. I don't think we all have the same goals. With some, many of us have the goal of, you know, separation of church and state and religion not. I have the goal of no religion anywhere in the world. I think religion is a toxic force. I think that even when it isn't theocratic, even when it isn't forced on us, I still think it does harm. I don't want anybody to believe in it. That is my goal as an atheist activist. So I think, and I, and if, and I think that your goal is absolutely valid, and I think it's awesome that people are working on it, but I think we need to remember that we don't necessarily have the same goals in this movement. Yes and yes. <laughs> I, I remember the arguments about including the T, transgender, in the lesbian and gay movement. All-nighters sometimes, like, it's too different, it won't, uh, and we got pretty strong. I want this. There, there is all of this faith and all of this sort of thing in the movement, in the LGBT movement. It is there, uh, just as there was the emerging lesbian and gay movement and then trans, and the conversation changed it. Trans is fully and wholly there now. Atheism will be fully and wholly there, I do believe it. Together, we can make this. Right. Well, everyone, it is, I have on my clock, 9.46, so we are one minute over. Um, I have a few announcements uh, from the front desk, or rather from our front desk. Um, if you didn't get a convention t-shirt because either you registered too late or you signed up on site or any of that, uh, we will have them on sale at the registration desk for $5, um, so relatively cheap there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a limited number of sizes left. Uh, and the, the women's run ridiculously small, so I apologize. Uh, the grab bag in the book and product room has been reduced to $10. If you haven't already purchased that, we're running out of items, so those of you that got in on the boat early, don't feel too bad, you got the best stuff. Um, if you have, are parked at the convention, uh, uh, excuse me, if you're parked at the hotel with your car, we have uh, $5 tickets. Uh, if you bring your parking uh, ticket, your stub, to the front desk or to the, uh, to the registration desk here. Uh, we will be able to give you a $5 off coupon. And finally, the art show ends at noon. So please go check out our artists. They have some fantastic, fantastic work. Uh, please don't outbid me on anything, but you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and just a reminder, uh, speaking of the topic of this panel, uh, the artists have generously agreed to give 10% of all proceeds uh, from sale of their art to Ogden Outreach which is an LGBT youth group uh, that ha helps, yes, they do, they do fantastic work for kids who have been uh, kicked out of their home or uh, just need help uh, on, on these issues. So uh, we're really pleased that they're accepting our donation and th that the artists have agreed to uh, generously give that 10%. So thank you once again to our panelists, uh, Marsha Botzer, uh, Greta Christina, and Zach Ford. Uh, and thank you all for being here.